the monumental success of Baldur's Gate 3 has got me thinking. Thinking about how exciting of a time it is for the isometric role-playing genre. What was once considered a dying relic of PC gaming's past has been given a shot in the arm and reintroduced to a new audience of players. And Baldur's Gate 3 is only the most recent in a growing influx of games that have deep systems, lovable well-written characters, and a web of choices and consequences that makes each playthrough feel unique. Being horny also helps. The masses have spoken and they yearn for isometric role-playing games. And by masses, I mean me. I want these games. Please, give them to me. This whole thing has also got me thinking about another isometric RPG. Fallout. Some of you may know it as the FPS RPG, while others may know it from its isometric roots, and probably a whole lot of you know it because there's a big Amazon Prime TV show of it. Sure, I've somewhat been thinking about it because of the TV show, but mostly because of my co-worker, Kurt Indovina who has been playing the original Fallout on his Steam Deck for the first time and loving it. The original two Fallout games were, back in their day, the pinnacle of role-playing computer games with deep systems, lovable well-written characters, and a web of choices and consequences that made each playthrough feel unique, and even predates the first Baldur's Gate by a year. So by the standards of when they were released, both games were successful. However, they didn't enjoy quite the attention and audience that both Fallout and role-playing games today enjoy. But now, Baldur's Gate 3 was the biggest game of last year, and Fallout is one of the most recognizable gaming brands around. And thanks to Amazon Prime, even your mom will know what a pit boy is. On top of all of that, we live in a time when PC classics of the 90s are being revitalized and made more approachable thanks to a series of incredible remakes and remasters. So the timing just feels right to crack open the vault and have Fallout 1 and 2 re-emerge to the modern era. When Fallout first hit the scene in 1997, it was a pioneer. The game built off its predecessor Wasteland and used the tabletop role-playing system known as GURPS for its foundation. It would be the first in a wave of legendary computer role-playing games like Baldur's Gate and Planescape Torment. And yet, Fallout stood apart thanks to its unique setting of a post-apocalyptic wasteland created from the rubble of an America stuck in the aesthetics and politics of the 1950s. What you end up with is a brilliant little genre fiction of the morbid and dark subject matter that is nuclear war through the lens of ridiculous extremes. There wasn't really anything quite like Fallout at the time, and arguably, there still isn't. And then there's the many iconic elements of Fallout we all think about. The Brotherhood of Steel, Vault-Tec, Nuka-Cola, Iguana on a Stick, and of course, my man, Ron Perlman. War. War never changes. All of this started right here in the first game. I did not grow up with the original Fallout games. I didn't even pay attention to the franchise until Fallout 3, it being my first game in the series like with so many others. It wasn't until I fell in love with the world and the setting that I finally decided to go back and give the older games a shot. It completely shocked me how little Fallout has changed. Much of what I associate with modern Fallout, its mood, lore, satire, mechanics, and even sound effects comes from these games. If you're looking for some of the most well-written, expertly crafted storytelling video games have to offer, Fallout 1 and 2 are still right at the very top. But for all of the ways that Fallout 1 and 2 do hold up, they have a major barrier working against them. They're old. It's the age-old problem all video games eventually face, the unflinching and never-ending passage of time, and the ever-evolving landscape of how games are made and how players interact with them. As a result, games can sometimes be frozen in time of when they were made, what they were made with, and who they were made for. All of this to say, Fallout 1 and 2 are examples of that time capsule, and as a result, aren't the most approachable by today's standards. First, let's talk about tutorials. 
Fallout has little in the way of in-game tutorialization, because back then, that stuff lived in the manual, which they cheekingly called the Vault Dweller's Survival Guide. Like, look at this. This thing is over 100 pages and covers every system from character creator, user interface, combat, you name it. It even devotes its opening pages to explaining in detail the real-world science of a nuclear blast. It feels less like a simple instruction manual for a video game and more like a rule book for a tabletop game because, well, it kind of is. It was an unspoken rule and expected back then that you would read this thing. And yes, digital versions come with PDFs of the manual, but the point is that people don't play games this way anymore, and you're not going to convince players today to read a book first. I don't want to read this thing. But you will need to, or you're going to have an even worse time with the dated controls and UI. I remember early on when I first played Fallout 1, I found myself confused why clicking on a guy to attack did nothing only to realize it's because my ammo was out, which was indicated by this tiny bar that I completely missed. But instead of having a reload button, you need to cycle through the active item button for the reload option, which I figured out through trial and error. Okay, sure, that is a single example of a one-time embarrassment, but the interface is full of little frictions like this that get in the way. Like how irritating it can be to have to constantly switch between cursors depending on which action you have to perform. How you have to steal from your companions to swap out their weapons. How you need to manually move money when bartering and also there's a cap that only lets you move 999 caps at a time. Or how I keep clicking on this ladder and it won't wreck it- oh, there it goes. And because controller support wasn't really a thing back then, God forgive if you try and be like Kurt and play these games on a Steam Deck. There's also the visuals. I love the way these games look. There's a real charm to the high detail pre-rendered sprites of that era. The way the faces are all based on clay models and hand animated. The wear and grime of the user interface like it too has been rusted in a vault for 80 years. And yet, I can't expect everyone to share my taste or accept the endearing nature of these visuals because, let's be honest, they look old. So old. Finally, I do want to mention that there is a fair amount of bugs in these games that lead to content not showing up or quest breaking, like this one here where Razor won't give me the hollow disk she's supposed to if I click this specific dialogue option. Having this stuff fixed properly would be so nice and help to preserve the legacy of these incredible games. I want to be clear, I don't think any of these criticisms make Fallout 1 and 2 bad games. These are simply the choices that were made and the limitations of PC gaming back in the mid-90s, which could be barriers of entry for modern players. I am very much the kind of person who thinks older games can still be great and worthwhile. I will always advocate for the original, and I encourage people who assume they won't like a game because it's old to open themselves up to give it a chance. But sometimes, that comes with having the context of the time in which it was made too. Sometimes going back and playing some older games means asking a lot of a player, like reading a manual because there is no in-game tutorial. And I emphasize all of that because I just so happen to go through the same thing with another acclaimed game. Welcome back to Citadel Station. We hope your somnolent healing stage went well. 1994's System Shock is another 90s PC classic, whose playability has been eroded by the passage of time even faster than Fallout. Because, you know, it can be a little intimidating, booting the game up and seeing, oh, the by Christ. <laughs> oh good, I can click here to crouch. Despite its reputation for being unapproachable, I have heard how the game still holds up with its storytelling, rich complexity of systems, and early 3D Metroidvania level design. Plus, I genuinely love the soundtrack. And yet, even for someone like myself, I struggled with its ridiculous interface and never found it all that fun to play. And I bounced off. System Shock was too old, even for me. That was until the Night Dive Studios remake came along. 
Night Dive Studios remake preserves everything about the original System Shock's design, but repackages it with a modern control scheme and user interface that doesn't require a manual open next to you at all times. And to my delight, Night Dive System Shock, despite being built around the design of a 30-year-old game, still bangs. I was able to experience all of the things people raved about with the original without banging my head against the keyboard in frustration. What a great feeling it must be for the game's original fans to finally see System Shock get the praise and attention it deserved, opened to a new generation of players. This is exactly how I felt with a recent example for a game even less old and dated than System Shock. A few years ago, I tried to convince my partner to give Persona 3 on PS2 a shot, after she played and loved both Persona 5 and Persona 4 Golden. Despite having grown up with the PS2, the game was simply too slow and dated for her, and she couldn't stick with it. We tried again with Persona 3 Portable, but no luck. It wasn't until Persona 3 Reload came out that it finally clicked, and she has since put in over 70 hours into the game and loving it. Persona 3 Reload isn't even that fundamentally different, largely faithful to the original. And yet, the few changes it does make were enough to draw her in when the original couldn't. She is the target audience for a Fallout remake. Literally, Baldur's Gate 3, one of her favorite games of all time. I know, she would love Fallout. Not gonna play those originals though. And that is the value of game remakes. The opportunity to take classic game design and represent it for a modern audience to enjoy. It gives new players the chance to enjoy what was so great about those games in the first place. And while I am just a single person on the internet who can't really influence the whims of corporations like Microsoft and Bethesda, the timing of all this just feels right. Even one of the lead creators of Fallout 1, Tim Kaine, made a video recently about how he would remake Fallout if given the chance, touching on many of the points I made. And if anyone should be an authority on a remake of Fallout, it's him. The reality is we're not going to get a Fallout 5 from Bethesda until after Elder Scrolls 6, which head of Xbox Phil Spencer said won't be until at least 2028. So yeah. It's gonna be a while. That leaves a lot of time for the Fallout franchise to sit around and collect dust. So while we're all waiting, maybe give people a chance to see what made Fallout so worthwhile in the first place. Man, if only Microsoft had a studio that, you know, has like made these kinds of games before and has also worked with Fallout and even like staffed some of the people that worked on the original Fallout games. Maybe Double Fine can do it.